Hi, my name's Catherine from Crime Psych. Welcome to my video giving a psychological analysis of Peter Sutcliffe, who is also known as the Yorkshire Ripper. Peter William Sutcliffe was born on the 2nd of June 1946. He's an English serial killer who was dubbed the Yorkshire Ripper by the press. In 1981, Sutcliffe was convicted of murdering 13 women and attempting to murder seven others. Sutcliffe had regularly used the services of prostitutes around Leeds and Bradford and the majority of his victims had worked as prostitutes. Peter Sutcliffe is an interesting case because after he was convicted he was diagnosed as having paranoid schizophrenia. Throughout his childhood and his early adolescence Sutcliffe didn't show any signs of abnormality. He did later develop an unhealthy, macabre sense of humour, but this was more likely to be related to his occupation as a gravedigger at the time. In his late adolescence, he developed a growing obsession with voyeurism, and he's reported to have spent some time spying on prostitutes and their clients. As with most serial killers, there is evidence of a progression in violent behaviour. In 1969, his offending began as an assault where he hit the victim over the back of the head with a heavy object. And this then progressed onto hitting his next two victims over the back of the head with heavy objects and then stabbing or slashing them with a knife. Sutcliffe first killed in 1975 and in 1976 he killed two more victims. And this is when the level of violence that he used increased. Once the victim was dead, he mutilated her corpse with a knife. I have mentioned in previous videos that there is often an escalation in the level of, of violence used in serial attacks. And this is because the offender wants to experience the same level of excitement with each attack. However, this often requires much more extreme behaviours each time, where a non-offender would only need a small increase in stimulation to achieve the same effect. Serial killers and serial attackers have an increased need for stimulation. They need more stimulation than non-offenders do. So to give you an example of this, just think about being on a roller coaster. And when we first experience the thrill our adrenaline increases, it causes a physiological response within us, it causes an increase in heart rate, dilated pupils, um, we produce more sweat and so on. However, once we've been on that same roller coaster a few times, it's just not as exciting or thrilling as it was the first time. So then if we were to go on a slightly faster roller coaster with higher levels of G-force, we experience that same high as we did the first time that we went on the slower roller coaster. However, violent offenders need a much higher level of stimulation. So with Peter Sutcliffe, we can see this progression from hitting a victim over the back of a head once to hitting the victim over the back of the head a couple of times and then going on to stab the victims. This progressed even more so with his next victim. Sutcliffe had bludgeoned her about the head with a hammer. Then he'd jumped on her chest and then he went on to stuff horse hair in her mouth from a discarded sofa which was nearby. He was interviewed several times throughout the investigation but was never charged. And when the police interviewed Sutcliffe, they, they could find no hard evidence against him. His wife even gave him an alibi on at least one occasion throughout the interviews. And as with any murder investigation, there's a massive amount of information for the police to process. And this was at a time when computer databases didn't exist. And so all of the information was paper based and this made it much more difficult for the police to keep track of all of the information. And if the police had have been able to easily identify how many times Sutcliffe had come under suspicion, then it's possible he would have been stopped a bit sooner. 
as well as the massive, massive amount of interviews and information to process, the police did receive a tape of somebody claiming responsibility for the murders and was taunting the police. The hoaxer was dubbed Wearside Jack by the press as the man who'd sent the tape in had a Wearside accent and this diverted the police attention away from Peter Sutcliffe despite an earlier surviving victim saying that the voice on the tape was not the same person as the voice that had attacked her. And in 1980 Sutcliffe was arrested for an unrelated offence of drunk driving and while he was awaiting trial for that he killed two more women. And this must have given Sutcliffe a feeling of invincibility. He'd been arrested and questioned on a number of occasions by the police and he still went undetected. And this would have only served to reinforce his behaviour and drive him to continue with his violent behaviours. And so after two days of intensive questioning in July 1981, Peter Sutcliffe suddenly declared that he was the Ripper. And this showed the level of control that Peter Sutcliffe had. He may very well have had a feeling of superiority because he chose to tell the police about his activities when he was ready. And the level of intelligence and awareness required to get away with so many murders for so long is really quite high. And over the next day, Peter Sutcliffe calmly described many of his attacks. He didn't show any sign of emotion when describing any of the attacks or any of the murders, which showed how insignificant the victims were to him. The majority of his victims were prostitutes, and so they clearly represented a group of individuals that Sutcliffe wanted to harm, and he gave very little thought to them as individuals. Sutcliffe only really showed any emotion over two of his victims and the first was his youngest victim who was 14 years old and it's thought that she was mistaken as a prostitute because of where she was at the time when she was killed and the second one he showed emotion over was one which he vigorously had denied and it was later discovered through advances in DNA that this victim had been killed by a, a convicted sex offender called Christopher Smith. Some weeks after the interview, Sutcliffe had claimed that God had told him to murder the women. He'd said that God had spoken to him and he'd sent him on a mission to kill prostitutes and that he'd carried out this work over a period of five years. And after a psychiatric assessment, Sutcliffe was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Paranoid schizophrenia is the most common type of schizophrenia. And schizophrenia is defined as a chronic mental disorder which in which a person loses touch with reality and that's called psychosis those with paranoid schizophrenia will have frequent delusions which are often very persecutory they can experience auditory hallucinations so in other words they'll hear voices which don't exist to anybody else the symptoms can have a huge impact on functioning and can neg negatively affect the quality of life Paranoid schizophrenia is a lifelong disease, but with proper treatment, the person with the illness can attain quite a high quality of life. And a person with paranoid schizophrenia doesn't, doesn't experience the world in the same way as other people do. They believe that their hallucinations or their voices inside their head are real. And these thoughts can be very intrusive and the patient doesn't necessarily identify him or herself as having a psychiatric illness. It's impossible to get away from these voices because they're in the patient's head. And if Sutcliffe believed he was hearing the voice of God urging him to kill these women, the drive to do so in order to stop the voices would have been immense for him. At his trial in 1981, Sutcliffe pleaded not guilty to murder on the grounds of diminished responsibility after the diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. 
but his defence was rejected by the majority of jury members. He's serving 20 concurrent sentences for life imprisonment. And following this conviction, Sutcliffe began using his mother's maiden name and then became known as Peter William Coonan. West Yorkshire police were criticised for the time that it took in apprehending Peter Sutcliffe, despite interviewing him a total of nine times throughout the course of their investigation. And because of the sensational nature of the case, the police handled an exceptional amount of information and some of it was misleading and that included the hoax recording um, of the message and letters uh, saying that they were from the Ripper. In 1982, the Byford report of the official inquiry, which was made public in 2006, confirmed the validity of the criticisms towards the police. The High Court dismissed an appeal by Sutcliffe in 2010, confirming that he would serve a whole life order and never be released from custody. He was transferred from prison to a high security psychiatric hospital in March of 1984. But in 2016, it was ruled that Sutcliffe was mentally fit to be returned to prison. And then he was transferred that month to uh, HM Franklin in Durham. I hope you have enjoyed watching this video i do hope that you've learned something from it thank you so much for taking the time to watch it i will be doing more psychological analysis videos in the future so i do hope to see you again if you've enjoyed this video please like it and subscribe to the channel and as i say i do hope to see you again soon thanks for watching bye for now